I want to talk today about God's perfect timing. You know, it's interesting. We all have pasts. We all have presents. We all have futures. Some things happen early. Some things happen late. Some things happen right on time, by my mind. Some things we look back on and remember. We all have remembrances and memories. And some things we look forward to and hope they're going to happen and think they will. And we're right in the middle of right now and things are active. In other words, we're in the middle of something called time. We're locked into a box, if you will, about the size of our earth or solar system, whatever you want to say. And in that box, there's past, present, and future, and there's time. Yesterday I was younger, and tomorrow I'll be older. And a year from now, and 10 years from now, and you know how that goes. We're locked in time. And we're constantly praying to God, asking Him for His will to be done about certain issues that we're concerned about. And we would want them yesterday if we could, but we'll take tomorrow. But God's timing is not our timing. You see, God is not in that box called time. God is the great I am. He's always in the present tense. When we're thinking about something that happened a long time ago, God is there right now. And we're thinking about something that will happen way down the road, God is there already. God is the I am that is always in the present tense. I had a conversation with a fellow recently, a brother-in-law, and uh, he said, yeah, I, I see God in this box of time, and I see God outside looking at all the forevers and all the pasts, and he sees them all at the same time. He said, I'd never thought of that before. And I said, you know, Ray Stedman, who is the pastor of Peninsula Bible Church just up north, is one of the ones in our generation that is credited with having first come up with the thought that Moses is going to get to heaven the same time you are. It could be. I mean, if indeed God is out of time and always in the present tense, once we leave time, who knows what's past or present or future and yet, God, because he loves us and created us in time, talks to us in terms of time. He that waits upon the Lord will renew his strength. Well, that's a, that's a phrase about time that God gives to us. We need to wait. I don't think there's any waiting in heaven, is there? That would be outside of time. And, and God asks us to pray for things to, to come and that our prayers can change things, and that we, God listens to our prayers and, re, and acts about things. But as far as God's concerned, they've already happened. You ever thought about that? I, th I, I remember that when I was a young boy, I thought about God being in a gigantic computer room, and that every single screen was every single second of every person's life, past, present, and future that God could see every moment of what happened from the beginning of creation all the way through the end of the millennium. If he's God, he sees it all, doesn't he? We don't, we don't question that God knows it all. Well, how does he know it all? Because he's outside of time. So from God's perspective, he's always right on time. That makes sense? From our perspective, we sometimes think that God's a little too early or a little too late or no, we need to come and see things from his perspective that he's always right on time. Did you know you were born at exactly the right time and that you'll die at exactly the appointed time? There's an appointed man, time for man, woman to die. God knows that. There's an appointed time for you to get that job or to make that transfer or to, to get that healing or Everything is in God's perfect timing. And we're going to see this lesson taught out of John chapters, chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. In the prelude to the story of Lazarus being healed. We're not going to get to Lazarus today. We're not going to get to the miracle that we'll be talking about in the next couple of weeks. But the prelude that happens before Jesus even goes to do the miracle teaches us about God's perfect timing. So that's what we're at today. Let's, uh, let's read it together. The next slide will be a 
the first of many slides that we'll read through the story, just verses 1 through 16. And I hope you'll follow along in your own Bible because we're going to be doing a lot of looking at that. But at least so we can read it together, it's on the screen. Ready, set, go. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore, Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, so that we may die with him. Crazy little scripture, but there's a lot there about God's timing and that's what we want to focus in on let's just pray before we come to examine the scripture lord we we've talked a lot about prayer today already and been praying but we just want to ask specifically that you be the teacher through this passage you gave john these words this is your word to us through john and we want to glean from it what we will not just learn about the story and what happened to jesus god that we want to see about that but we want to learn about your timing and how your timing is different than ours, and how we need to really truly learn to wait on you, as we've been singing, to wait on the Lord, and to trust in you for your perfect timing. And we ask God that you teach us now by your spirit as I speak, in Jesus' name, amen. So take your Bibles if you have them, hope you do, and, or your devices if you don't, and turn to John in chapter 11, just about halfway through this, this gospel now. Very exciting. And as we have said many times, and I just remind us that John's purpose in writing John was very specific, and it was that you might know that Jesus is the Christ and that he is the one that you need to trust in to ensue. So he's choosing this story and this word with that in mind. John chapter 11 begins as we just finished reading. And I'm just now getting to it here. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So we understand that the God, the, this chapter of 11 is going to be about the miraculous resurrection of Lazarus. I think all of us know that story or have heard of it, but we're not going to get to that. There's a prelude that happens before. There are three siblings in this family, Lazarus and Martha and Mary, brother and two sisters. Jesus loved them. It says that in our passage down in verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. We understand that Jesus stayed often with them. Bethany is only a short hour's walk, maybe two miles at the most, from downtown Jerusalem, the, the temple. So Jesus would stay there with his disciples. Maybe they had a barn or a building that they could all stay in. And they often stayed there and then went into Jerusalem from there. We know 
that when it comes to Palm Sunday, which is just right around the corner, they were at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and that Palm Sunday on the donkey took place on the very road that they would walk on from Bethany into Jerusalem, about two miles. So the setting is in Bethany, but I want to tell you something that we need to know. There's a huge time gap between John, John chapter 10 and John 11. If you were just reading this, you wouldn't know that. You would just have the story, you'd be reading along in chapter 10, and then it says, now a certain man was sick, and so on. You think that just the next thing that happened. There's an entire year, full year of time in Jesus' ministry that John leaves out. You say, what happened during that year? Well, if you remember, we were at the Feast of Dedication, or that we know as Hanukkah, back in chapter 10. Remember that? That would be winter time, about what our Christmas would be. So right at the end of our December. This happens one year later in winter, right about December, this, this Lazarus. And this is leading up to what will happen to be his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus's, the following spring. What happened during that year? Well, I put them up there for you to show that there was no small things that happened. For instance, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, when Jesus takes all the disciples up on the mountain way, way north in Galilee. So after he had been in Jerusalem, he went back to Galilee, his home, probably Capernaum, traveled even further north, went up on the mountainside, and Peter makes that great statement, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We all know that. Not very long after that, he takes them up on another mountain. He takes Peter, James, and John up on another mountain, the mount we know as Transfiguration, and Jesus unveils himself in his glorious person to Peter, James, and John. They see the person of Moses and Elijah there, and there they want to build altars and all that, and they come down totally transformed. John leaves that out. Matthew, Mark, and Luke give it to us. But remember, John's purpose was not to redo the things that the other Gospels had said. John came along 50 years later. This is 50 years after Jesus has died that John's writing this. And he's looking back at Matthew, Mark, and Luke and saying, they left all kinds of stuff out. I want to include the stuff they left out. And so he puts in Lazarus. Isn't it amazing that Matthew, Mark, and Luke leave, leave out Lazarus? They all have their different reasons for doing things. Also during that year, there is an entire ministry tour all over the entire uh, land of Israel. John chapters 9 through 17 record it. Matthew doesn't record it. Mark doesn't record it. John doesn't record it. Nine chapters, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 chapters of teaching and parables and miracles, all between chapter 10 and 11. So if you have your Bibles, put one year between the two. And we know that Jesus was in Jerusalem at the end of chapter 10 because he was at the Feast of Dedication. And we know that he wasn't in Jerusalem at this portion in John in 11 because that is, that, that Jesus said, let us go back to Judea. So obviously he wasn't in Judea. So that's why a lot of things happened during that. I just want to let you know that. It has nothing to do with the story, but it's good to know, isn't it? Now the second thing I want to point out to you is verse 2. We have a very curious Verse 2, verse 2 of chapter 11 says, it just, John is identifying who this Mary was. A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This was the Mary, John wants us to know the author, who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. You know that, that's, that account, don't you? You've heard of the story of, you know where it happens in the Bible? It happens in the next chapter. It happens in John chapter 12. So here's John in chapter 11 saying, this is the Mary who anointed the Lord with her ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, but that doesn't happen until chapter 12. What's that about? Well, think about it. John's writing all this 50 years after it happened to an audience who is very familiar with the story of Mary wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. And he's just pointing out, as he's talking about this story of Lazarus, this is the Mary that you all know about who anointed the feet with, who anointed the feet with hair. But the actual account doesn't happen until the next chapter. I just think that's really curious. And, it, and I want you to know, there's an, also another place in the Bible where another woman washed Jesus' feet with her hair. Luke chapter 7, totally different occasion that happened a couple of years earlier. That was a prostitute in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of the Pharisees' homes, totally different accounts. So there's two different times that two different women wiped 
Jesus' feet with her hair out of, out of love for him. Just a curiosity, thought you want to know that. Isn't that interesting? I thought it was interesting. If, if you don't care, then let's go on, all right? All right. But now let's get to the actual story. So the sisters sent word to him, to Jesus. They're in Bethany. He's somewhere else, very possibly up in Galilee or maybe anywhere else in Israel, but not in Judea, not in the southern part of Israel. How do you send word that day? It isn't by text. It isn't by email. It isn't even by horse and buggy. It's by foot carrier, folks. So who knows how long it took from the time that Mary wrote this note, gave it to some courier to go running somewhere through the countryside. It could have been a, a day or two, but certainly many, many hours. Who knows how long it took? And the sister sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, whom you love is sick. What a sweet call for help, a fervent call for help. And of course, Jesus loved this family. We read that in verse 5. He loved Martha and his sister. They were like his best friends in the world other than his own disciples. And here's a sweet letter from the sisters. You're, the friend that you love is sick. So what would you expect Jesus to do, the healer? What would they expect him to do? As soon as he could, pack his bags and take us to, and get, get to Bethany. Not what happens. There's a surprise response. And often when we pray something or ask the Lord for something, we get a response different than what we think the Lord should do. We think the Lord should answer our prayer because he's a good God and he wants to give us the desires of our heart, that we, he should start answering our prayer and that we should get that pretty soon. Maybe within a week or a year or some, but all of a sudden there's usually and often a surprise response from the Lord where he says, my timing is not your timing. It's not that I didn't hear you. It's not that I don't care. It's not that I don't love you. But my timing may be for even a different purpose than what you're even asking. Do you really trust me that I'm the God that knows what I'm doing? Do you really trust me that basically there's only one prayer that makes any ultimate sense to ask God for? You know what that one prayer is? Your will be done. And if his will is done, we're happy, are we not? Aren't we, are we not? But God, could you do it earlier? <laughs> could you do it sooner? No, he won't. Because his timing is perfect. Anyway, we get this, this strange, let's go back one, if you will, still, Bill. We get this strange, but then we also have a lesson in God's perfect timing. What is that lesson? That lesson is that God's timing is different than ours. Remember, he's the great I am outside of time, and he sees what the need is. He sees what you've asked. He, he cares, but his timing may be different. It may be that he wants to, that, he, that, that you're asking for something that's, that's not very good, and he wants to say no, and aren't we glad that he knows best, Father knows best, and he says no. Or it could be that you're asking, hey, Lord, please do it next week, and he says, no, I've got something for you so much better down the road. I, would you trust me on that? Would you really trust me? He wants us to ask. In this case, they're asking for what seems a very honest request. Our brother is sick. We have seen you heal hundreds of people over the last number of years. You heal everyone that comes to you. You love healing. You are the healer. I know that you can heal our brother. Of course you want to come and heal your best friend. So we know you're going to come, right? Next slide reminds us of a couple of important scriptures. Would you read that Isaiah scripture with, with me on Isaiah 55? Let's just read that together. Can you see it? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now I'm convinced there's not one of you that disagrees with that. You all know that God's thoughts are greater than yours. You all know that God's thoughts are better than yours. You all know that God knows more than you do. But somehow, when it comes down to our needs, God, could you do it earlier? Could you do it sooner? Could you? And then, in Acts 1-7, this is one of the very, very last things that Jesus said before he ascended. 
It's at the very beginning of Acts. He's taken his disciples out on the mountainside, and he's, this is post-resurrection, 40 days after the resurrection, 10 days before Pentecost, and he's just not about to ascend to the Father. And the last thing that he says to them is this. Read this with me. It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. The Father has fixed. The Father knows what's going to happen. That doesn't mean there's not free will. That doesn't mean that we don't need to pray because it's just all going to happen anyway, God. God just happens to know. He's outside of time. He says things are fixed. And, he says, and, and I know certain things. that he, Jesus had to die exactly the moment he did. Not one day earlier, not one hour later. Exactly that moment for things we've talked about in past messages. So there are lessons to be learned. And then beyond that, and the next slide is going to show us some more scriptures, we need to learn to wait on God's timing. Wait on the Lord is not something that just is in one or two scriptures. It is scattered throughout the Old and the New Testament. But I just just gave you three from the Psalms. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. And anytime it repeats, that's extra strength. Wait, wait, wait on Him. We sang it this morning in our opening song. You know, wait on the Lord. Psalm 37, 7 says it, to rest in the Lord and wait patiently. Oh, that's so easy to say and so hard to do. Wait patiently for His timing, for Him believing His will. And, and as soon as we pray, believe that He's already acting. God isn't saying, well, I'm, not, I'm just going to sit around and do nothing for a while. God already has heard your prayer and He knows what's happening. And then the third one, we sang it right before the message. Be still and know that you are. It actually literally means cease striving and know that I'm God. Cease trying to do it on your own. Cease worrying. Cease thinking about it. Cease trying to make God do something that is not his will. Relax. Be still and let God do his thing. Those are just three of multitude of scriptures that say to wait on God's perfect timing. So we come back to our text And the sisters sent word, and when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, that the the Son of God may be glorified by it. Notice he uses the phrase Son of God that he now has identified himself as back in chapter 10. He'd never used that phrase before. Now he's calling himself the Son of God. In other words, he says, my ways are higher than your ways. I have purposes for Lazarus that you don't know. You want to heal him. And if I healed him, what would happen? He'd die. A month or two or a year or ten years later, he's going to die. But I want to do something even more spectacular. I want to raise him from the dead. And not just raise him from the dead, because I've done that to two other people already. Jesus had already done two resurrections we know about, to a little girl and to a little boy. I want to raise this guy after he's been in the tomb and stinks for four days. After you've already had the funeral... You've already had the service. You've already passed out the flowers. And he's gone and done. And when I get there, you're going to say, you're late, you're late, you're late. And God's saying, I'm never late. I am right on time. But they don't know that. They don't understand that. This sickness is not to end in death. So now we get to the next slide, and we're going to see that there's there's a confusion on the disciples' part, as there often is on us, when we wonder why God is taking his time. There's two questions they have. The first as to why Jesus would want to return to Judea. Do you notice he says that, uh, verse 6, when he heard that he was sick, how would you finish that sentence? He packed up his bags and got on the road right away. No. When he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Confusing. God has a different timetable. It could be that when you ask of God for something and you want it yesterday or tomorrow, that God says, in a year or two, in a decade or two, when you get to heaven, God knows. We trust Him. So then in verse 7, Jesus said, 
Okay, after two days, now let's go back to Judea. Now let's go to Judea, which tells us that he wasn't in Judea at this point. So the courier had to go a lot of miles to find Jesus and find out where he was and get to, he was probably back in Capernaum to his home, more than likely. And Jesus says, now let's go. And the disciples are confused, as you and I would be, right? So their first confusion comes in verse 8. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Every time they'd gone to Jerusalem, more and more and more. You remember in chapter 10, they wanted to stone him. They wanted to stone him. I and the Father are one. Let's stone him. I'm the Son of God. Let's stone him. They always want to kill him, kill him. And the, it's marching on to his crucifixion. And they say, why would you want to go back to a place where there's a death threat on your life? And Jesus says something that we need to take real stock of. He gives kind of an interesting riddle, and it's in verse 9 and 10. He says, are there not 12 hours in the day? Now, he knows that the sun always doesn't go down in 12 hours, but basically there's 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. He says, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble. Why? Because he sees the light of this world. If, if there's sunlight, if there's light, if it's daytime, you can walk freely. But he's talking spiritually, isn't he? If you walk in the light of my presence, you're not going to stumble. There's not going to be a problem. And then he says the opposite in verse 10. But if anyone walks in the night, and of course he's not talking about physical night, he's talking about spiritual night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. I put up on the screen for you just a really simple explanation of what he's saying. When one walks in the light and protection of God, one need not fear stumbling. That same principle is said throughout the New Testament if you look at it. Jesus said, if you walk in my light, if you walk with me, you'll be safe. We all know Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You're, you're, you're going to protect me. Now, this is not saying that we'll never have anything bad happen to us because we're Christians. People are beheaded. People die. People are persecuted. And things happen. But it does mean that if we're walking in the light of God, there is no fear. Remember in 1 John, same author, John says, there's no fear in love. There's no fear when you're walking in God's light and in God's love. We need not fear. Yeah, we may stumble. The worst that's going to happen is we'll go to heaven. But we're in God's light. We, we should not fear the unknown because the unknown is in God's hands. Remember back in chapter 10, we are in the palm of his hands and the palm of the Father's hands and the, and the Lord's hands. We are protected. God guides us. Yes, we yet need to be wise and not stupid. We don't need to walk into danger. But if we walk in the light, if we're walking with Jesus, we need not fear. We need to realize that he is with us and protecting us all the way. So Jesus says, I can go back there. Of course, Jesus also knows that the timing, he knows perfect timing, that it wasn't his time yet. It's still going to be months before he's crucified. But take that to the bank and spend it. If you're walking in God's light and in his truth and in his love, you need not fear. God protects us. The other question they had is, what does Jesus mean by Lazarus only falling asleep? Is Jesus playing with us? Is he just trying to tease us? No, I don't think so. So what did Jesus mean when he said, then he said, that our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. What do you think he was talking about? He knew he was dead. In fact, he makes it clear in the very next verse. Okay, Lazarus is dead. I'll make it obvious to you. But what he was saying is that the truth is when someone dies, let's use Cal as an example, who are going to a memorial service this Saturday, or use Carlos as Drew and, and Andrea's uh, father, father-in-law, when one who knows Jesus dies, from God's perspective, they're not dead. Oh, they're physically dead, 
But they're not dead. They're just, they're just asleep in the arms of God. Do we not say that when we go to memorial service? Cal isn't here. Carlos isn't here and so on. Are we saying that they're not dead? No. They're simply saying that they are alive in real life. And Jesus is trying to help them to understand this, that the purpose he has for Lazarus is far beyond just raising him from the dead, but to realize that I am the resurrection and the life, which is he going to say later in this chapter. So you see those two confusions that the disciples had. They didn't get it, but finally Jesus says, okay, plainly in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. I'm not playing games with you. I understand that he's physically dead. But then he goes on in verse 15 to again up the ante and point out that God's ways are higher. He says in verse 15, And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Because if I was there, come on, heal him, heal him. And I would have healed him and he would have, then we would have lost the opportunity to raise him from the dead. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go. So the next slide is going to just point out that God's plan has a greater purpose. I see three obvious greater purposes in Jesus waiting and in not going there to heal him. Number one, he just gave the big hint right there. I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. Do you not think that those disciples took a huge leap in their faith when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead after four days in the tomb? What? I mean, you would have been impressed, right? Come on. Come on. He's walking out in grave clothes, and he's not stinking anymore. And he starts talking. He says, I'm hungry, you know. Whoa. Blew their minds. It blew the minds of everybody in that area. And that's another purpose that Jesus had. Do you, do you know that Jesus was holding back the wrath of the Pharisees, and then less holding back the wrath of the Pharisees, and then less holding back the wrath of the Pharisees, till finally he was putting it in their face, and he was timing it, timing it, because he's in that box, timing it so that exactly at the time when he was supposed to be crucified, they crucified him, had him crucified. So the Jewish leaders had deepening hatred. We, if, as we go on and see the story, there were Pharisees that were hanging around Lazarus' place to see what Jesus is going to do, and they were horrified when Lazarus was raved in the grave. Can you believe that? Why were they horrified? This just proves that this guy is out to lunch, and we're going to kill this guy. So he had, Jesus had in mind that he wanted to make that crucifixion happen right on time, and it was part of his plan. But I want to show you the third one. Do you not realize that your faith and my faith in Jesus is stronger because Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave? Every time we read that story or hear that story, we're amazed, are we not? I mean, we're amazed at every miracle, but that, that really stands out. It takes a whole chapter to tell it. John tells it to prove that he was God. Nobody but God could make someone raised from the dead. And our greater faith in Jesus' divinity. So there's a greater purpose in the plan. That's why Jesus waited two days. That's why he didn't go there and heal him. He had at least those three plans and probably far more than I can even think of as to why he waited for the glory of God. It reminds us a lot of, of the story of the blind man. You remember the blind man and the disciple back in chapter 9? And the, the disciples asked Jesus, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Remember what Jesus said? Neither he was born blind so that God's glory might be shown in him right now, and I'm going to heal him, and he made him. In other words, God had a greater plan. It was God's will that he be born blind. It was God's will that Lazarus die. Do you know what? That after, he, after Lazarus rose from the grave, you know what happened to Lazarus? He died. I mean, I don't know when, but he died sometime down the road. He didn't heal him forever. This wasn't the resurrection. This was just another miracle, another sign, an amazing sign of what he was. So I want to finish today with five key lessons about God's timing. And every one of them is so critical. They're kind of in sort of an order. Of course, order is time too, isn't it? So 
Watch these. And next time you pray for something, next time you ask God for something, particularly when you're just desperate that God work in your life, <coughs> let these have a purpose. This is number one of five. And you're going to agree with every one of them. It's just that we don't often live them. We don't often act on them. Everything has its perfect time. Do you agree with that? Yeah. And we all know Ecclesiastes 3.1, especially if you're old enough to remember the birds singing about it. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season. You know, that's just from Ecclesiastes 3.1. There is an appointed time for everything. And there's a time for every event under heaven. That's saying again, God, who's outside of the box that we're in, in time, sees that everything has its place and its purpose, and he knows it, and it's an appointed. But for us who are in that box, what are we supposed to do with that? 1 Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. In other words, trust that he knows better, Father knows best. I don't know what's going on. But God, you know what's going on, and you love me, and you care for me, and you've promised me that you're going to help me to walk in your path, and you're going to protect me through the dark times. And I'm going to trust you. I'm going to humble myself under your mighty hand that you might exalt me, or you could put help me, or comfort me, or encourage me, or answer my prayer at the proper time. Notice the word time is in both of those verses. There is an appointed time. Exalt you at the proper time. The proper appointed time is what we pray for. You are to be married. You are to get that job. You are to get that promotion. You are to whatever it is at the appointed time that God knows is best. So everything has its perfect time. So that's number one. Number two, wait for it. Wait for it. Over and over again, we've already seen some of the scriptures in the Psalms, but look at these two other ones that are so special. For the vision is yet not, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. There's that phrase again, appointed time. It hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. In other words, it's going to happen. Your prayer is going to be answered. Might be in heaven, might be 10 years, might be tomorrow, but there's an appointed time. Though it tarries, in other words, though it doesn't come as soon as you want it to, wait for it. It will certainly come. It will not delay. Do you believe that? Yeah, you believe it. But somehow we don't live it out. We're impatient and we, oh. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. There we have it again. We're in time. So wait for it. We believe that everything has its purpose, right? We believe that God has his Appointed time, God's going to take care of things. So wait for it. Wait for it. Trust Him. Keep asking, but wait. The third principle. Everything has an appointed time. Wait for it. It's hard to wait, isn't it? God will give you the strength to wait. God will give you the ability to wait. We just sang this scripture at the beginning of our service. We all know it, right? That, by the way, is inappropriately says Isaiah 30. It should say Isaiah 40. I apologize for that. So if you're taking notes, it's Isaiah 40 that that's in. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, <laughs> that's me, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. You get impatient, wait for the Lord. Ask him for the strength to wait. And then if you ask him for that, and as you wait on him, you will mount up with wings like eagles, run and not grow weary, walk and not become weary, and you'll have the strength to wait on him, the patience to wait. So if you struggle with waiting, if you struggle with patience, wait on the Lord. Come to him, ask him for that strength which he will give and promises to give as we wait for his perfect timing. The fourth principle, seize the moment. Carpe diem, right? Proverbs 27.1 says, don't boast about tomorrow. Don't talk about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't wish it was going to happen tomorrow. All that could be true. For you don't even know what the day might bring forth. All it's saying is make today count. Sure, make plans. That's fine. Sure, pray for what might happen. Sure, think about 
what might have future. But don't worry about it. Don't be concerned about it. God has the future in his plan, in his hands. In fact, he sees the future. He's in the I am in the future. You don't know what today might bring forth, so seize the moment. And I love Colossians 4, 5 in the New Testament that says, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity, or it could say most of the time. Use the time that you have. If you're waiting for something, make today count. Make today special. Seize the moment. We live in the I. I just lost that moment. <laughs> it's, oh, I, I'm over here. It's, what? You know what I mean? We're moving like this, but God is always in that I am. Seize that moment with him, and as we co-focus on him, somehow time just kind of slows down, and we have that moment to grab. Don't let that opportunity for that conversation, that special moment, acknowledging that miracle that Gail talked about. Yay. And then number four. All God's purposes will be accomplished in his way, in his time. Yes, that person you're praying for may never come to know Jesus. That doesn't mean you don't keep praying for him, but God knows. God has the appointed time. Yes, that job may not come that you want, but maybe he'll bring another one. But God has it all in his hands. We, we trust him. I love the phrase from a song I learned a long time ago in a choir that I conducted that says, we don't know what's around the corner, but we know who will be there. We know that he will be there. We can't see around that corner. We can't see tomorrow, but we know that he'll be there, and he'll take care of that tomorrow. Isaiah 46 is a great passage. It says, for I am God, and there is no other. Amen, right? I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my Purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. In other words, I will accomplish my will. My will will be done. You know what the very first part of the Lord's Prayer is after we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer. And we, we believe it. Now let's act out those five, okay? Let's believe them. And whatever you're waiting on, whatever you're concerned about in time, he has it in his hands. Let's trust him for it. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of songs that are going to help us nail this. Um, Priscilla's uh, favorite songwriter already preached this sermon when she wrote Trust in Him. We're going to sing that next. But let's pray first. Team, why don't you come up as, we, as I pray. God, we thank you that you are outside of time that you know all things past, present, and future as if they were, in our perspective, happening right now. And yet, God, I thank you that you deign to talk to us in terms of time, God, because you know that we're in time. You talk about the past and how we need to forget and let and seize the moment and how we need to look forward to things that are coming. And we thank you, Lord, that you've actually placed yourself in time, that Jesus came down. For him to wait two days was kind of weird. I'm sure to be God waiting Oh, Lord, thank you that you have promised us that your timing is perfect, that all things will be established, that you know all things and you only have good for us. Help us to learn to trust in you for your perfect timing. In Jesus' name, amen.